welcome back everyone to the Sequoia Park Zoo's conservation lecture series. Uh, thanks for joining us on Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. I'm Dr. Ruth Muck and I'm our Director of Conservation and Research at the Sequoia Park Zoo. I chair the Zoo's Conservation Advisory Committee, which oversees the Zoo's conservation programs that were highlighted in the slideshow. We are very lucky to have Papa and Barkley sponsoring this lecture series again. They have supported this series for many years and they make this virtual series possible. So thank you again to Papa and Barkley. Um, before the lecture starts, I would just like to go over how to interact with us during the lecture. First, as a disclaimer, this lecture is being recorded and is streaming live on Facebook. And if your connection to Zoom is dropped and you're unable to reconnect, you can also watch or comment live on Facebook. And if you're having trouble connecting to Zoom, you might not be logged into an account. And we do require a participant to be logged into a free Zoom account first before clicking the link to go to the lecture. Then at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a chat button. You can ask questions to the speaker by clicking on the chat button, which will pop up a chat box where you can type your question. And if you're watching from a phone or a tablet, um, you might need to click on the three dots that are at the bottom of the app, which will then give you the option to click on the word chat to open the chat box. And we will try to answer everyone's questions at the end of the lecture. We'll also monitor um, the Facebook Live comments as well and answer questions from there. So feel free to submit the questions as the lecture is going and we will get to them at the end. And during our in-person lectures, we always pass the hat around to collect donations for the zoo's conservation fund so that our zoo can continue supporting conservation work across the globe. <coughs> uh, this year, we're virtually passing the hat by sharing a link to donate in the chat. And for those of you on Facebook, you can donate at our website at sequoiaparkzoo.net. So thanks everyone for prioritizing conservation. Um, joining us tonight is David Giuliano, who will be introducing tonight's speaker. Mr. Giuliano is an agriculture inspector for the Humboldt County Department of Agriculture. He has served on the Sequoia Park Zoo's Conservation Advisory Committee since 2012 and is our birding expert. So David and I are about four years into a research project studying the impact of our zoo's native plant initiative on the wild bird community that visits our zoo. Thanks for joining us tonight, David, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is David Giuliano, as Ruth said, and tonight's speaker is Lania Quinn Davidson. Um, I'm lucky enough to work in the same building, Humboldt County Agricultural Center. Uh, she's been there nine years. I've been there going on 15 now. Um, she's down in the UC Cooperative Extension, and she is a fire advisor with UC Co-op. Uh, her primary focus is on the human connection with fire, increasing the use of prescribed fire for habitat restoration, invasive species control, and ecosystem and community resiliency. Lania works on prescribed fire issues at various scales, including locally in Humboldt County, where she works with private landowners to bring fire back to land as a land management tool. At the state level, where she collaborates on policy and research related to prescribed fire and helps inspire and support prescribed burn associations, and nationally through her work and leadership on prescribed fire training exchanges. Lania is passionate about using prescribed fire to inspire and empower people from rural ranchers to agency leaders to young women pursuing careers in fire management and everyone in between. And I will add, she also makes an amazing gingerbread. Just had to throw that in there. So uh, without further ado, I will pass it off to Lania. Oh, well, thank you, David. That's such a sweet introduction. I didn't know you were fond of my gingerbread. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you. Thank you for joining this presentation and coming to learn a little bit more about prescribed fire and all the great things that are going on in California right now. Um, so my name is Lania Quinn Davidson, and I am the fire advisor for University of California Cooperative Extension, as David said. Um, I'm also the director of the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council, and I am sitting right now in my bedroom in Arcata, bundled up in a blanket because it is so cold <laughs> tonight. It is, what, a, what a chilly and stormy evening. 
um, I think it's a perfect time to be talking about fire and seeing some, some beautiful fire pictures. So with tonight's presentation, I'm going to share some of the awesome stuff that's going on around fire in California. Um, you all know that, that you know, it's just been a, a crazy few years as far as wildfire goes. And that's been a really kind of hard and um, you know, dark time in some ways for, for us in California. But it's also been a really beautiful time as far as people coming together and trying to find solutions and, and work at the community scale to be proactive. And prescribed fire or the use of fire as a tool has been a huge part of that. And there has been so much interest in reclaiming fire um, as, as a tool in bringing it back to our landscape in making it a community-based you know, model that where we can actually have some, um, some role and some power around the fire problem in California. And I think, you know, given that this is a zoo lecture, I think it's really important to note that a lot of the work we do around prescribed fire is not just focused on preventing wildfire. Um, it's really focused on restoring ecological process, uh, you know, making ecosystems more healthy, and providing biodiversity for, for California, for everyone in California. So um, I'm gonna dive into a little bit of but what's been, you know, why do we use prescribed fire? What is it? How does it kind of play a role? And then what are some of the neat things that have been happening and how are people mobilizing around this? So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to start just talking a little bit about the fire problem in California. And I don't know how many of you who are watching are here in Humboldt County, or if you're around the state. This is a photo from my hometown. I grew up in Hay Fork in Trinity County. And I just recently went back there to look at um, the areas that were burned in the Monument Fire. The Monument Fire was threatening Hay Fork you know, for a lot of this summer. My mom was evacuated. It ended up evacuating probably 90% of Trinity County, um, you know, all, not only Hay Fork, but all around the county because that fire was growing in all different directions. And um, just really, you know, we all, in, all of us in California are, are dealing with the fire problem. We're dealing with more than a century of fire exclusion on these landscapes. These are our places that evolved with fire, that need fire, and we've kept it away for so long. And, and now we're, we're kind of reaping what our ancestors and what we all have sown. And so I think I like to share this photo of my hometown because fire is, I, I got into fire because growing up in a place like Hay Fork, you were experiencing fire all the time. And, um, and that hasn't stopped. Somehow we're just, we're still in that pattern. And I think it's interesting to think about the way that fire is portrayed in the media. And, you know, we, we get really focused on how big these fires are. Like the Monument Fire was a couple hundred thousand acres. When I was a kid growing up in Hay Fork, that would have been totally outrageous. Now that's kind of the norm. You know, we had the August complex last year that was a million acres. The Dixie fire was almost a million acres this year. Uh, the, the fire sizes are growing. I think eight of the, the largest fires in California, in, in known California history, have happened in the last handful of years. And so we see images like this come out that show that we're really, the, you know, our relationship with fire is changing. These fires are changing. And they're all really focused on size. And you know, so we saw the, the idea of the, the giga fire with the August complex and that we were getting to the, the scale where fires are just completely out of our control and much bigger than, than we've ever known before. But I do wanna point out, I think it's really important to understand that acres are not necessarily the fire problem. So the size of these fires and the areas that they're burning in California are not necessarily the problem. We know from fire history studies in California, we have actually a pretty robust body of literature around fire history in California. And we know that the annual acres burned pre-European settlement in California were at minimum four and a half million acres a year. Now, if you'll recall last year, we had about 4.2 million acres burned in California. So we weren't actually even at that historical scale of impact that fire had. And the fire problem isn't so much about the size of these fires, it's about how they're burning and the damage that they're causing. You know, the lives that we're losing, the homes that we're losing, 
um, the severity of these fires. So the, the fact that the Dixie fire grew 100,000 acres in one day last summer, uh, that, that's unprecedented. But the size of these fires is not. And, and what we know is that our landscape in California is hungry for fire. This is a fire adapted place. Um, Stephen Pine, who is a fire historian, wrote in a recent book that 54% of California's landscape is fire dependent, actually meaning that it requires fire in order to persist. So, you know, we have certain ecosystems actually require fire, 54%. And most of the rest of California is fire adapted. So it ha, you know, our, our ecosystems have traits that allow them to survive fire and to, to thrive with, a, with frequent fire. So acres aren't the problem. The problem really is that we've kept fire out of these places for so long. So what do we do? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can actually restore fire to the landscape on our terms during times of year and you know, under conditions where we can be safe um, and we can do that with prescribed fire. So prescribed fire or cultural burning is the, the use of fire under specific conditions and, and you know, in, in specific places for really predetermined reasons and objectives. So we, we use it for a lot of different things. And, um, and this is really my passion and my focus. I work on prescribed fire issues like David said, I, I do a lot locally, but I also work on policy issues and nationally I work on training and really just trying to bring fire back to these fire adapted places that need it so badly. And that's the only way we're, that we're really going to um, you know, get, get ourselves out of these fire problems. So prescribed fire is really critical to this. So I wanna talk a little bit about what we use it for. And I think that, um, one of the things that gets a lot of attention and we, we tend to have a pretty singular focus on is the fuels reduction aspect. And you know, the fact that we can use prescribed fire to reduce fuels and to increase resilience to drought and to future wildfire. So there, there is a lot of literature to support this. It's well studied. We know that prescribed fire, uh, you know, actually fire on the landscape is the best fuels reduction strategy that we have. And that's because it actually consumes the fuels. So if you're in a place that has a lot of fuel on the ground and you are able to burn in there, um, you're actually able to take those fuels away. A lot of the other strategies that we have in our toolbox, like thinning and mastication, they're really important too, but they don't necessarily remove those fuels. Often they just displace them, put them on the ground, um, you know, change the structure, but don't actually consume them. So prescribed fire is really important in this way and also for thinning out our forested areas and just giving things more room to, to thrive and to be healthy. These are all photos from Southern Humboldt County and um, a burn that we did a few years ago in the Shelter Cove area. And this was right up against a home. We were able to do a really wonderful, about three acre burn around a home in the hills of Shelter Cove. And it was a great example of a fuels reduction burn. But that's not the only reason we burn. Um, and you know, I think for, for this, I'm sure because you guys are joining a zoo lecture, you've got a real focus probably on, on wildlife, on biodiversity, on more of the ecosystem process. And for most of us who are engaged in prescribed fire, that's, you know, those are the things we're managing for. So we also have a lot to learn and really are, are centered in a lot of ways in, in indigenous burning and cultural burning. And you know, the idea that indigenous people in California have been burning forever and really are the originators of this concept of, of prescribed fire or controlled burning or cultural burning. Um, the idea that, that you can use fire to manage your landscape. And so we have so much to learn from our partners you know, with local tribes and, and around the country who are engaged in cultural burning. In, in Humboldt County in particular, where we are, we have some amazing leaders in, in fire and in the cultural burning realm, uh, you know, with our tribes on the mid Klamath and you know, folks that are really leading at a national level and, and changing the whole discourse around prescribed fire and, and cultural fire and what that looks like and who gets to be involved and who are the experts. And so it's really exciting to be able to partner with, with these cultural practitioners and to understand how and why they've been burning for thousands of years and to bring that into our practice too. 
So cultural burning is a really critical piece of all this. And I'll talk a little more about that. We also do a lot in, here in Humboldt County, but also across the Pacific Northwest, we use prescribed fire for oak woodland restoration. And this happens to be one of my favorite ways that I use prescribed fire. You know, we have a, a real issue in the Pacific Northwest with conifer encroachment. And a lot of these oak woodlands evolved with frequent fire. So when we took that away, the Doug fir and some of the other shade tolerant, fast growing tree species have really been able to take advantage of the absence of fire. And they grow up and they over, you know, they overtop these, these oaks. Um, the deciduous oaks are especially prone to being overtopped and, sh you know, shaded out. And then they actually die. And we're able to use prescribed fire to get in there earlier when those, when those conifers are small. And so you see in that left-hand picture, that's a white oak woodland out near Bridgeville. And those are all little fir trees that are growing up. They're just a carpet of fir trees. And if we left those for about 50 years, they would overtop those oaks and those oaks would die. And we'd also lose the whole understory, all the grasses, all the things that are so important for the wildlife in that area. So oak woodland restoration is a really key part of our prescribed fire program throughout the Pacific Northwest. We also use prescribed fire a lot for invasive species control. And so we can use fire at really strategic times of year to manage things like star thistle, medusa head, barbed goat grass, these really nasty invasive species that are taking over our grasslands in California. So if we get in there at, at a really specific time of year in the late spring, early summer, when everything else has gone to seed, but these, we call these late phenol species. So there's, there's species that, um, that don't go to seed until later. So everything else will be dry and they're, they're sitting there and they're still green and their seeds haven't dropped. And we're able to burn right in that window of time and really effectively control some of these things. So prescribed fire is very important for, for that as well. And then we also, in the more coastal areas, both here in Humboldt County and, and all the way down the coast of California, we can use prescribed fire to manage shrub encroachment in our prairies and grasslands. So again, we're able to get in there and, and open things up and really be more conducive to the, the grasses and the forbs and all of those, you know, those, those more open species that make up our prairies and grasslands. So I just really wanna point out how important prescribed fire is, not just for fuels reduction, it's not just about wildfire prevention, it's really about, you know, bringing fire back as a process on these fire adapted landscapes. And I love this, um, this was a, a tweet that one of my colleagues put out a couple of weeks ago after a workshop she hosted. And it was a quote from one of the workshop attendees that said, how do you prescribe burn a million acres in California with a million landowners? And um, you know, that it's kind of, a, it's a cute quote, but it's actually pretty powerful because what we've seen in, in you know, the last century and even in the last decades, last few decades, is really a professionalization of prescribed fire. Um, you know, the, the originators of prescribed fire were, were the tribes and, and the indigenous people in these landscapes and then the ranchers. And only in more recent decades has it become something that, that CAL FIRE and that the Forest Service and the, the fire management agencies have really dominated. The roots of prescribed fire and the average people living on the land and managing their landscape. And we're really trying to get back to that. And that flies in the face of the current fire culture. We really live in a culture of fire exclusion and fire suppression. So um, I think this tweet really sums up that what we're trying to do and the work that we do is bring fire back to the people and to get to empower people to start using this tool again and start connecting with fire and to start feeling more comfortable with it. And I really love this, this quote. I, I wrote a blog last year um, kind of talking about the future of fire in California and if we could envision, you know, what, what, what's the future that we want around fire. And my colleague, Will Harling, who's a dear friend of mine, he's out on the Mid Klamath, he wrote this beautiful poem as a comment on this blog. And this is only a portion of it, but I wanted to share it because I think it really paints a beautiful picture of what a future with fire could look like again. You know, we've kept fire away for so long, but what would it look like if we had fire back in our landscape? And um, if we were a little more centered on fire in the ways that we probably should be in a place like California. So I'm gonna read this. You can read along if you want, or you can just close your eyes and listen, but I just think this is so beautiful. So in 10 years, Californians will think about fire like Floridians. 
Prescribed fire will still be more fun, but about as stressful as mowing the lawn. 10 years from now, or perhaps 100, we will learn to live with fire because the lessons will keep coming. Eventually, every one of us will have lost a piece of what we love, and we will choose the uncertainty of embracing fire, even while it burns us. In 10 years, creeks that have been dry for decades will flow again. Salmon will turn gravels that have long been out of reach. The fruits of the land will be sweeter, the deer and elk fatter. We will remember what it means to be stewards of place, to give back what is owed to the land that feeds us. And so what he's talking about here is just the interconnectedness, that fire is connected to all of these pieces. It's connected to the salmon and to the deer and the elk, and, and it's connected to us. And our health on this land in California is tied to our connection with fire, whether, you know, whether we recognize it or not. So I really think that's a beautiful piece. And again, it, you know, a lot of this centers on this indigenous wisdom that we have in California around how powerful fire is and how central it is to, um, to us as, you know, being able to live here and being able to thrive in California. And it's been neat to see that a lot of the work that we've been doing in the last couple of years has been able to bring that in, in a really, um, I think with integrity in a really meaningful way. And so we've been doing some, some great policy work around prescribed fire this year that brought together some really unusual partnerships. And I think it's because there's this realization that a lot of people who, who need fire and who have an interest in it are not, um, you know, they're not necessarily the fire management agencies. They're, they're normal people. They're the ranchers. They're the tribes. They're the in, environmentalists. They're, they're all these folks who can come together around this issue and work together. So we worked on um, a bill this year that changed the liability standard for prescribed fire in California. And I'll talk a little more about that. But it had this partnership of the Karuk tribe, the California Cattlemen's Association, and Defenders of Wildlife, all coming together to endorse one bill, which was pretty much unprecedented. You know, the, this group of folks got together and we, we were having conference calls, we, we issued a press release. And it was just funny. <laughs> We're like, wow, this is such a neat group of people to have together. Uh, this, you know, these conservative ranchers and these tribal folks and, and these environmental groups all saying we need more fire on the landscape and um, we need more cultural burning. So that's been really neat to see. And a lot of that came across in a report that the Karuk tribe put out earlier this year. There was a group of us um, convened by the Karuk tribe to identify barriers to prescribed fire and to identify opportunities for moving forward. And so I can, when I'm done talking, I can share a link to some of these things that, that they issued this wonderful report that really got into the details on what we can do better and how we can move forward. And we saw a lot of that come out in a new report that was um, mandated by the governor's task force, the forest management task force. And so there was a, a prescribed fire strategic plan that was developed. So for the state of California, what is our vision moving forward and how we're going to bring more fire back to California's landscape. And this is the cover page. This report is being finalized and probably will be released really soon. But this is a woman named Asia Conrad, who's a Karuk woman. And I think it just really speaks to the fact that there was a lot of involvement to, you know, that good fire report to the practitioner community in understanding what the issues were and trying to bring those forward in this statewide strategic plan. Like we're really at a point where people are interested in wanting to, to move forward on this stuff. So I like to think of the work that we're doing in California as a movement. It's really a social movement. We're saying enough is enough. California is having enough hard times with fire and it's time to bring prescribed fire back to communities, back to the people and reclaim it as the critical and really emergency process that it is. I mean, we, we, are, we need to do this now. And so there are all these amazing things happening. And this is a map of community-based prescribed fire groups in California. If I had shown you this map three years ago, it would have mostly been gray. Um, there just wasn't a lot going on. We had some, some neat stuff going on in Humboldt County. We formed a prescribed burn association here. That model spread, there's tons of momentum. And now we see almost 20 prescribed burn associations across the state people wanting to use fire and wanting to be involved in, you know, being part of a solution. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of these efforts. 
Um, there are some of us who work kind of statewide. So you see me and my colleague Jeff there on the right hand side, and then my friends Aaron and Miller and their son Alder who work statewide, going around helping mentor, helping train folks, helping you know these community groups form so they can do this amazing work. So you know there are those of us who are kind of operating at that level. And then there are all these really cool local groups. So I'm just gonna take you on a little tour around California uh, so you can understand some of the neat stuff that's going on. So out on the mid Klamath, there's a group called the Cultural Fire Management Council. And this is led by a woman named Elizabeth Azus, who is Yurok and Margot Robbins. And um, they are just really focused on bringing fire back to the Yurok ancestral lands. And so they do um, training exchange events. They do a lot of coaching on family burning trying to bring fire back to the, the Yurok lands. Super inspiring. There's also a group out on the Mid Klamath, the Mid Klamath Watershed Council. So my friend Will, whose poem I read, he's one of the directors of this organization. And they host every year a big training exchange event where they're training community members, they're bringing folks from outside the area, all to work together and, and get more of these you know, great projects done. So this year they facilitated six weeks of burning and training out on the Mid Klamath. And they ended up doing 867 acres of burning. And they had people from all different backgrounds. You can see that list there. They had 170 people participate from tribes and volunteer fire departments and agencies and prescribed burn associations and private contractors and just really doing some amazing training and, and capacity building out in the Klamath. We see something kind of similar happening in Butte and Plumas counties as well, where these prescribed burn associations have formed just in the last couple of years and they're hosting trainings and they're getting people out and there's just so much demand for this. I mean, you think about Butte County and what it's gone through, people are hungry for something different and they just really wanna be involved. And I love this picture on the left-hand side. This is my friend, Hannah, who's one of the leaders of the Plumas group. And those are her triplets and they were out on a prescribed burn together just a few weeks ago and um, training people. And, you know, this is, this is a family thing. This is, this is no longer just a professionalized thing where firefighters in yellow suits. This is about people learning to, to understand fire again and to, to really be empowered around it. And it's so exciting. They have hundreds of people now in Butte and Plumas counties who are trained to, to do this work and to get out and, and be involved. There's a similar group in the North Bay area called Fire Forward. And so um, this is an initiative led by Audubon Canyon Ranch and they have 442 community members training and implementing burns. Um, they have a fire, a local fire crew that responds to wildfires, it's all community members. And then they have a fire fellows program that's kind of a mentorship program to lift up leaders who are emerging uh, in that area and, and really give them the tools they need to be leaders in this. So, you know, again, year, even five years ago, none of this was going on. This is all very new and there's so much excitement and momentum around it. It's really cool. And then the other thing that's happening is down the southern part of the state in the central coast. So Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo area, they are revitalizing the range improvement associations. And these were old burn cooperatives from, you know, back in the 40s and 50s ranchers getting together and implementing prescribed burns together, they had kind of fizzled out. You know, they had lost their momentum. A lot of people got old. Um, a lot of folks just weren't burning anymore because they were afraid uh, and they didn't have the support they needed. And this movement that we've had in the last couple of years has totally re-energized these groups. So these range improvement associations are just starting to grow again and the ranchers are getting involved and then other people are getting involved and it's becoming much more community-based, I think, than it probably was historically. And um, so that's all happening on the central coast. So you really see like this stuff is happening all over the state. And so many people are excited to be involved. And one of the things I do is I work on policy at the state level, trying to better facilitate all these things and, and to make it easier for folks and to give them the protections they need to do this work. So in the last couple of years, we've had a lot of big wins in the policy realm. We were able to, um, to legislate a state certified burn boss program so that we'd actually have a, a state certification for folks to work towards so they can be identified and, and recognized as leaders who can plan and implement projects. Um, you know, you kind of think of like a registered professional forester. 
this is the equivalent of that. So someone in the state of California who can be recognized for having expertise in prescribed fire. So that was mandated by a bill in 2018, and we're just rolling that program out. This year, we were also able to set aside $20 million in the state budget to establish a claims fund, so like a state-backed insurance pool for people who are doing this work. So they can have some coverage and not be you know, totally going out on the limb every time they do a project. And then we were also, as I mentioned before, able to change the liability standard in California to further provide protection so that the state, you know, if someone's doing a project and they're following all the best management practices and they're being really safe, that they're going to have some protection from the state if something weird happens and they need some help, uh, you know, if, if something goes wrong. And so those are all things that our, our counterparts with the agencies enjoy. You know, they, they're indemnified in the work that they do and they have protection from their agency. But those of us who work in the private sector have never had anything like that. So we've, these have been huge wins and just really exciting momentum. And I think working toward a better future for prescribed fire in California. So um, another thing that, that happened in the policy realm this year was we had, there was a bill that was really focused almost entirely on cultural burning and how to have preserve tribal sovereignty around the permitting process and around how we manage prescribed fire and cultural, cultural fire. So that bill, Assembly Bill 642, had a lot of really critical components, including developing a cultural burn liaison within Cal Fire who can work with the tribes and just really trying to recognize and respect the role that tribes and cultural practitioners have played in all of this um, and how important they are in moving forward. So as I bring the presentation to a close, I just wanna share this photo, I put this photo collage together and this really is California's prescribed fire movement. All these amazing people, these community leaders around the state who are showing up and doing the hard work and really doing inspiring work that's cutting edge and flies in the face of what we have known around fire for the last hundred years in California. So these are the people who are the game changers. And uh, I feel really hopeful working with these folks and knowing that they're out on the ground. They're, they're people that, you know, the communities know and love, and they're the leaders who are gonna, who are gonna bring us forward in this. So you should all feel good that the, the wildfire problem is immense and it's, it's, it's daunting for sure, but we have so many passionate, passionate folks who are working on this. The work we do is really fueled by our, our passion and our love for bringing fire back to California. So thank you so much for having me. And I think we're gonna open it up for questions and feel free to contact me if you have any um, you know, questions or if you wanna get engaged with any of this work wherever you are. Yeah, thank you so much, Lania, that's great. Um, I think we're eager to jump in with questions. So I'll share questions from the Zoom chat. Um, and from Facebook Live comments, and we'll keep checking for any new questions that are submitted. Um, so you can just, as you're thinking of them, as we bring up things, you can <laughs> add in more questions. Um, and as a reminder, the lecture series is possible thanks to the sponsorship of Papa and Barkley, and our other conservation programs would not be possible without your help. So we'll paste the link to donate to our conservation fund in the chat. Um, so. I'm going to see if we have any questions here. I have, I have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to share um, links to any of those documents, like the oh, yeah. fire strategic plan? So we can paste those in the comments here um, in the Zoom chat. We can also put them on Facebook Live, which will be saved for people when they do the rewatch. So yeah, there's, it. OK, I just posted the strategic plan. And then what else? And this good fire report. Yeah, I have lots of links. You could spend all day posting, posting links. Um, but these are great resources. You know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if my presentation, like, I don't know what the background is. I see one of my good friends in the audience, Will Emerson, who's been a wonderful partner in our prescribed fire work. Um, but, you know, for some of you, maybe this is a brand new topic and maybe it was like, whew, <laughs> Hopefully not. But. No, I, thought it was a, I thought it was a great introduction, even for folks that didn't know a lot about fire. They might not know some of the terms about being burn boss and what that might entail. I mean, it sounds pretty awesome, and it is awesome. If you want to become a burn boss, there are 
these great new avenues for doing so. So that's really interesting to hear about that, the trainings that are gonna be offered. Um, I know you mentioned a lot of places where these are private lands that folks are mm -hmm. doing prescribed burns on. Were there certain spots in Humboldt that you were working on this fall? Um, you know, it, this fall we had a couple projects planned in Southern Humboldt. So there's there's quite a bit of interest in Southern Humboldt from the landowner community down there. And um, we have a great guy named Kai Ostro, who's with the Bryceland Volunteer Fire Department. And he's our liaison in Southern Humboldt. Um, the way the weather worked out, we, you know, you all remember it was like, it was sunny and nice. And then suddenly it was a torrential rain for like three weeks. So our window kind of caught, cut short this year. And um, we weren't able to do a couple of the projects that we had planned, but yeah, we have we do a lot of work in eastern Humboldt County, so in the Bridgeville area. A lot of that oak woodland work is out in that in that zone, uh, and then we do a lot in the Bear River area as well. So out in those coastal rangelands. We have a question from Catherine. Catherine asks, one of the other speakers in this series talked about the landscape created by beavers in the past. Mm. Um, the dams created by beavers caused wet places for wildlife to flee during a fire. The beavers are gone, so these wet spaces no longer exist. Uh, what will happen to wildlife, and are they being taken into consideration during the prescribed burns? Yeah, you know, the, definitely. Um, this And the scale of our burns is pretty small on, in the scheme of things, you know, and so, and the way we burn things, we don't, we're, we're not like encircling areas and then burning in. So we think about wildlife in the way that we put fire on the landscape. But certainly when we're burning, um, you know, they're, they're small, smaller projects on the order of tens to hundreds of acres. And we, I've never seen any kind of impact to wildlife. We do think a lot about the bird community in the spring. So if we're doing any kind of burning in the spring, we, we want to be sure we're not affecting nesting birds and things like that. Um, and so a lot of the burning we do for like the invasive species control for Medusa head and star thistle is later, it's in June, and it's mostly just in the grass and in those annual grasslands. So, you know, it's not as much of a concern, but if we're burning in blackberry or in the oak woodlands at that time of year, we have to be more thoughtful about that. It's definitely on our radar. Yeah, I think most, folks nowadays are used to these large out of control fires that are not being con uh, planned mm -hmm. by people that are trained in doing prescribed fire. So it does look so different when you're on those landscapes with people yeah. who are trained in doing it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a definitely a mental shift thinking about what that looks like. I know I've been uh, seen a lot of video of prescribed burns. I have um, folks I used to work with who were doing that in North Carolina, um, mm -hmm. working with a lot of endemic plants there that really require, it's yep. part, part of their conservation plan there because these endangered plants require the fire and it had been suppressed there as well. So yeah, um, yeah. so we're kind of doing some of the same stuff here. And I, I wonder too, if there were certain endemic understory, you kind of talked about the oak woodland and how those, those canopy trees require the burn to remain dominant there? Are there certain understory plants that are endemic in our area that are some favorites people might not know require fire? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I like to think of the oak woodlands, you know, I'm cer I, I'm certainly care about the mature overstory trees, but it's really about that whole plant community. And so if you look at, for instance, the Bald Hills and Redwood National Park, I'm sure many of you who are local here have hiked up there and checked those areas out. And they have a very active prescribed fire program. They've been burning the bald hills of Redwood National Park for 30 plus years um, on, a, you know, on a pretty regular interval. And what we see in those frequently burned oak woodlands is they have hundreds of herbaceous species that grow there. So you know, all the, the wildflowers, I mean, one of the, one of the examples that people are familiar with are, are the lupin. And so the, the lupin in the Bald Hills become kind of a tourist attraction, right? We, we go up there and we, we know we're gonna get to see these amazing blooms. And those blooms are tied directly to their prescribed fire program. We know that two years after burning, 
the lupin are going to go crazy. That's the cycle. And so we can actually predict in the bald hills where the good lupin blooms are going to be based on their prescribed fire program and how they've rotated the burning. Um, so that's kind of a, a classic one that, that we talk about in the prescribed fire community. But I think it's important to realize that those those oak woodlands, like I said, have hundreds of species of herbaceous species. So tons of grasses and so many forbs and wildflowers. Um, and in the adjacent encroached conifer forests, so those young dug fir forests that have taken over the oak woodlands, there will sometimes be two species of plant that are growing in those. I, I used to do, I had a whole research project where I was doing um, botanical surveys in the open and frequently burned and open oak woodlands versus those encroached conifer forests. And sometimes we'd have plots in those fir forests that had no plants, zero, you know? And we had just been out in the oak woodland trying to identify 40 or 50 plants in a, in a one meter a square, you know, one meter square area. So it's, it's striking the, the biodiversity differences in those frequently burned landscapes. Um, I have someone, Michaela, has her hand up. I don't know if she's able to unmute. I think she is. I, I am. I'm trying. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. I was trying to get my, my video on, but I can't do that. So, um, hi, Lenya. It's nice to see you. And thank you so much for this talk. I wanted to comment on something you said as well as ask a question. So I think you, you really, you, you did a great job at explaining to us these positive aspects of prescribed burning. I think that's something that this community, um, you know, we really, it's great for us to hear because as you said, we in California are, are pretty scared of fire and this had some really detrimental effects on people and livelihood and families and homes and lives, right? It's very scary. But what you're talking about is, is a really different beast, right? And so I think that's awesome. I loved hearing about all of the different things that prescribed fire is used for. So, so thank you. But so my question is then, I'm wondering about who regulates prescribed fires statewide because you talk very freely about, oh, it's so great. We not sorry. It, <laughs> we're supporting prescribed burning, and all these groups are getting together. But and yet, as you mentioned, you know the tribes have been trying to burn for decades, and they're told they cannot. So there's some force that's keeping suppressing fire. I know this is. I love hearing that this is changing over time. But um, I mean, so one of the questions is who is regulating that, and then do you? Is there some support for helping this legislation, which says that prescribed burning is not only good for, you know, fighting invasive species and repopulating, but also for reducing the intensity and severity of those natural fires? And mm -hmm. sorry, and also that the prescribed fires aren't causing these giant fires. I think people are thinking that prescribed fires are going to get out of control, which I think none of our big fires have been caused by prescribed fires. So, okay, that's a multiple stuff. So who's regulating this? How are you, you are successfully now navigating this and allowing people to burn and how is that impacting this landscape of good fire versus bad fire? Thanks, that's a very long question, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great questions, Michaela. Um, so who's regulating it? So we have two primary bodies that are regulating prescribed fire. One is our local air quality districts, you know, which are um, tied to the California Air Resources Board and are uh, basically implementing national, you know, federal laws around air quality. And so at, in locally here, it's the North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District is in charge of regu regulating the emissions from prescribed fire to make sure that we're not impacting communities, um, hospitals, schools, roads, things like that. So we work really closely with the air quality districts to make sure that we're doing things right. And we have smoke management plans and we have permits and all of that. And that happens year round. Then on the fire side of things, CAL FIRE is the regulatory agency. So CAL FIRE is, is in charge of regulating uh, and permitting prescribed fire, especially during fire, like declared fire season. So from May 1st until the end of declared fire season, we have to get permits through CAL FIRE. They typically want to come out and see the project. They often want to be there when it's happening. 
Um, in the winter months, they're not as involved because we don't have to have a permit from them. But, but yeah, they're the kind of the big dog in the room. And, you know, when we talk about these cultural changes and, you know, the fact that the tribes have been needing to burn for a long time, but haven't been able to, or that the landowners have wanted to burn, but haven't felt like included and haven't felt like there's a spot for them in all this, that really comes down to that agency culture. And this, um, I work really closely with CAL FIRE, so we have great CAL FIRE folks here locally, but you know, there's a real culture around fire in the Western US that is about, we put fires out and, and we're not typically lighting fires <laughs> for benefit. And so we're working on shifting that and trying to really shift the conversation and say, actually fire is important. And why wouldn't we wanna do it when the conditions are right and, and make that choice and do it really intentionally instead of just waiting for it to happen to us. And so we're seeing that change. And I think, you know, at the, at the state level, we're seeing CAL FIRE saying that and supporting that and setting their own goals and really trying to increase their own programs and do more prescribed burning. And it's just a cultural shift and it takes time and um, a lot of gentle pushing and nudging. And that's why it's so important for community members to say, no, we want this, like <laughs> we need this. And, um, we don't want to just keep putting all the fires out. Like we need to do more. We need to be more proactive. So yeah, I think that's that's really important. I'm trying to remember, Michaela, what the second part of your question was. Oh, I, I think you've really answered it. I really appreciate okay. that you're having this conversation with us, but uh, you know, with all the people in the state and that there is this shift. And I'm thinking, what an exciting time for you to be working on this, seeing, you know, 10 years ago to today and having this shift. So that's really exciting. So thank you. You answered my questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it is really exciting. It is a time of incredible change. And that's why I call it a movement. You know, it's, it's like a social movement and people are just every day, it's people are getting on board and the media is contacting me. And it's like, it's crazy. It's just a really exciting time. And we have a few questions in the queue. So don't worry, folks, I do see them. We're, we're getting there. Um, Cheyenne asks, can you speak to the planning process for a prescribed fire? So considerations such as wind, grade, yeah. steepness, dryness, moisture, that sort of thing. What goes into those? Um, yeah, great question. Um, really good. So that's really the prescription part of prescribed fire, right? We, we always have a burn plan that we've developed in advance where we've identified what it is we're trying to do. So what of those objectives that I listed off is it that we're trying to do? And there are lots of other ones too. Um, and then you kind of work backwards and say, well, what's the kind of fire we need to achieve that objective? And what's the kind of weather we need to achieve the fire that we need to achieve that objective? So we do this kind of process of working backwards and, and in some cases modeling fire behavior based on certain weather conditions. In other cases, and especially when you're working with experienced folks like those cultural practitioners or ranchers who've been using fire for a long time, they sometimes know, you know, oh, it's the first two weeks of January is always a good dry period. And, and I can walk out and the leaves are crunchy underfoot. And I know that's the right time. So you've got different ways of, of having that knowledge, but that's really that prescription part is that we're not just going out and hoping things work out. It's really well-defined in advance. And you are looking at things like fuel moisture, um, relative humidity, air temperature, uh, wind, wind speed, wind direction, those are all part of the prescription. And then you have a plan for how you're actually going to put the fire on the landscape. So we actually, in the prescribed fire community, talk about it like it's an art there. And you actually, you're kind of painting fire on the landscape and you're moving it, you know, you, you're putting it in a certain pattern and working it against the topography and against the wind. And there's so much nuance and art to it. It's very, it's very artful. <laughs> and so you, if you ever come out on a burn, you'll, you'll see that and you'll feel that it's, it's, um, it's, an, it's, it's not just let's go light it off. And I think people are certainly interested in getting involved in mm -hmm. those programs. Um, someone would like you to talk more about the Burn Boss program and how that will help landowners who want to get involved and burn on their land. Yeah, yeah. So 
So that burn boss program, you know, one of the big gaps that we have in California, there are a lot of landowners who want to do this work or want to learn about it or have a project in mind, but aren't, don't feel comfortable leading it themselves. So the burn boss program is really important because it's certifying these experienced people to come out and consult with you. They might be people who will end up being private contractors. Um, they might be folks who will work for a local nonprofit or someone like me who works for the university and could be a resource for you. And those will be people that you could call on to say, hey, I'm kind of interested in this and I don't really know much about it. Could you come walk my property with me and talk about developing a project? Or could I hire you to write a burn plan? Or could you come out and lead the burn with the local prescribed burn association? And so um, that's what we're trying to develop is we, we in the state right now have, like I could name on one hand, the private burn bosses that are available to California landowners. That's how, that's how narrow that pool is. And it's not because there aren't experienced folks, it's just because they don't have a way to be certified and to get insurance and to be recognized by the state. So we're hoping that this will just like open the floodgates, get a lot more people out there so that you all can work with them and increase this, the scale of this work. Yeah, absolutely, that sounds good. And is, that was a link <laughs> that, we sh that you shared, I believe. Yeah, and if you're interested in that, like if you're someone who has actually ha has quite a bit of experience in prescribed fire or is looking to, to do more, send me an email and I'll add you to um, my list. I'm going to put my email in the chat here because I have, I'm managing like the mailing list for that state certified burn boss program. And I hosted the first class here in May in Humboldt and I plan to host another one. So if that's something that's of interest to you, shoot me an email. Oh, great. Um, you know, I was thinking about the the prescribed fires that are being done on these private lands are able to be controlled. So because the fuel load is quite different than what we're seeing in these national parks and forests, where the current, it, there, it just seems a fire imbalance there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wonder, can you scale this up to be able to do these prescribed fires in the national parks? Or is it, how is it, how is it working since most of what you talked about was on private land? Yeah, well, actually, so, you know, the thing with prescribed fire versus wildfire, it's all fire. It's just burning under different conditions. So um, we're, with prescribed fire, choosing conditions where the fire won't burn in such a severe way. And so it's not that it's different, you know, the, the landscape, sometimes it has been thinned in advance or treated in some way, but really it's about the weather conditions more than the fuels. And, and so more than, you know, the amount of fuel on the ground, it's really about when we're burning it. The, the national parks in particular have been real leaders in prescribed fire. The park service, like I mentioned, Redwood National Park having such a great prescribed fire program. Yosemite National Park is one of the best leaders in the Western US around prescribed fire and manage wildfire. They, they have a whole program where they let wildfires burn in the high country. And um, they're some of the only examples of intact fire regimes in the whole West Coast. Um, Sequoia National Park, you know, some of, the, some of the stands of Sequoia that survived these recent wildfires were because of the prescribed fire programs that they had there. So the National Park Service is a real leader in this actually. And this work can definitely be scaled up to a more landscape scale. It's just about doing it under the correct conditions. And are we needing more folks out there to help get it done? Absolutely. Yeah, the workforce is a huge, yeah, the workforce is a huge issue. And so you all are probably familiar with the, the recent infrastructure bill that passed that has a bunch of funding for, for federal fire crews. So to get more people who can do this work, not only working in fire suppression, but also in, in doing the prescribed fire and fuels work that needs to happen year round. So hopefully we're going to see a real change and shift within our federal agencies as well. It's all really exciting. Yay. Well, I, does anyone have any final questions for Lania? It's been a pleasure having you tonight and hearing about the great work that your organization is doing and all the ways that we can get involved. I didn't realize that this program was growing so much that folks that aren't professionals like you can get more involved, so. Absolutely, yeah. It's just wonderful. 
All right, well, I don't think we have any more questions. I don't see anything coming in. So thank you again for joining us tonight, Lania, and sharing about all that outstanding work that you're doing to keep our forests healthy and keep people safe. <laughs> so good luck with all of the future projects out there. Well, thanks for having me. And thank you all for taking time out of your evening to learn about fire. <laughs> it's great to, great to see the interest. For sure. Um, to remind everyone, our next lecture in the series will be on Wednesday, January 19th at 7 p.m. Ken Ramirez is giving a talk entitled Conservation Connection, Training to Save Wildlife. Also, if you're like me and still doing holiday shopping, you can pop by the zoo's gift shop. Um, you can get give the gift of a membership. Um, I went today and bought matching beanies for all of my family. So these they're great gifts for you there too. Um, just check it out. Okay, we look forward to seeing you all at the next lecture on January 19th. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.